I'll just tell you a little story from Boston. The lady was celebrating her 80th birthday. She was one of Boston's very proper Bostonians. Well, her friends uh, said to her, so surprising that a woman of your wealth and your leisure hasn't traveled. You haven't been places. Why haven't you traveled? With a great deal of uh, disdain, the lady said, why, I'm already there. And that is the attitude that we have to assume uh, here. We're not going any place. We're already there. This is heaven. And it isn't only that this is heaven, but every minute of every day, we're never any other place than heaven. And there's only one reason why we appear to have discord. And that is because of a belief that we've accepted that we're not in heaven now. The moment you can drop that belief and sit back in the realization that that which I am seeking I already am, or whatever goal I have in life I've already achieved, you'll find that just about 90% of all the world's troubles drop off of our shoulders. And the reason is embraced in two words, I am. Now, I am forms the basis of the Master's teaching. I am, and it means everything it says. Not I will be, and not I shall be, and not I would like to be, and not I ought to be. If you judge from appearances, you still have a demonstration to make, so have I. Everyone has a demonstration to make if they judge from appearances. Because according to appearances, we live and move and have our being in a material universe, and anything can happen to us, and lots of things do. Now, the overcoming lies in two words, I am. I am in heaven now, I am about my Father's business now, I'm in the secret place of the Most High now. I live and move and have my being in divine consciousness now. And the reason for that is this. As a matter of actual truth, there isn't a person or a law or even a mental belief that in and of itself has any power to do anything to us. Whatever power it seems to have, we give it by the acceptance of these universal beliefs instead of meeting them with the truth of being. You can meet almost anything in the world, eventually anything in the world, with a treatment that consists of two words. Or oh, I increase it a little bit and say, thank you, Father, I am. I've always been in the habit of those words, thank you, Father. We'll know why later, but thank you, Father, I am. The way this revealed itself to me was in my first year of practice when uh, I had a case that wasn't yielding and the uh, claim was so much pain that I had to sit up at night to try to meet it for the lady. <clears throat> at one period, the thought came to me, there is a truth that would meet this. And uh, if I just knew the truth, we could meet this pain, this condition. And I just kept praying, oh, what is the truth that will meet this? What is the truth? God, give me the truth. And uh, long about two in the morning, I decided to take a little nap for a few minutes, then I wake up and walk again. And I awakened out of this nap with the words in my ear, 
that which I am seeking, I am. Oh, but that can't be true, because I'm seeking a truth to meet this claim. I can't be the truth. I need a truth. I'm seeking a truth. But the second time and the third time it came, that which I'm seeking, I am. And how can I be the truth? And then, of course, the Master's words came back. I am the truth. I am the way. I am like eternal. Oh, I thought, that's right. I am the truth. That is the teaching. Well, I thought, if I am the truth, this lady is the truth, too. As a matter of fact, I guess the disease must be part of the truth. So there's nothing for me to do about it but have a good night's sleep. And I did. And at the o'clock in the morning, I had a phone call of a complete healing. You see, the disease in and of itself had no power. But all the practitioners and all the teachers, including myself, that had been working on it, were holding that disease in thought and giving it power and trying to get rid of it. And that's the equivalent of looking down there and trying to remove that snake from the middle of the basket of flowers. Well, you know, suppose we sit up all night to get rid of that snake. We won't get rid of it because it isn't there. It's up here. So now a misperception of a beautiful flower. There wouldn't be any use of looking over there, holding it in thought, trying to get rid of it. It won't work. You can't do it because it isn't there. The work has to be done up here, not out there where the claim seems to be. And the work has to be done along the line of realization of those two words, I am. Is there a selfhood apart from God? Then I am that selfhood, am I not? Well, but isn't that true of all the Hitlers and all the Stalins and all the other characters in the world that we think of sometimes as pretty terrible people? In their true identity, aren't they the Christ? And isn't all this mad action that the world is going through due to the belief that they're not the Christ? and that they have to go out and either make a living or become famous or leave a reputation behind them. Now, <clears throat> and it's all right for them. That's their highest sense of right. They haven't come into the light of the wisdom of their true identity, and so they have to be satisfied with a substitute. They have to be a president. They have to be a leader. They have to be a dictator in order to satisfy their ego. We have to be something to satisfy ours, too. But we've learned what it is uh, that we really are, and it's so much greater than all that. We are children of God. And as children of God, heirs, and the heirs, joint heirs, and that means we are the Christ of God. I am he that should come. And uh, in that realization, we don't have to boast about it to the world or get meadows for it. On the contrary, the greatest joy comes from hugging it to our bosom within ourselves and saying, oh, just think of the world, know who I am and what I am. And then that part of the world ready for the revelation receives it. Certainly, Jesus was never recognized as the Christ by uh, the higher-ups of the Hebrew hierarchy, nor of uh, Rome. That's true, because mortal material consciousness can't look at Christ and ever see it or recognize it. That's why only Peter could say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Everyone else thought he was a reincarnated Hebrew prophet. And so it is that only those of some degree of spiritual consciousness could read a spiritual message and say that's a spiritual message, or meet a person of some degree of spiritual evolution and say that is a person of spiritual consciousness. You see, you have to be it yourself in order to recognize it. That's a law, too. That's a spiritual law. That is why 
when uh, you pick up a book on truth or metaphysics and you say, that has nothing for me. And somebody else picks it up and uh, says, oh, that's the gift of God. That's straight from heaven. Well, if it's a book, let us say, on mental science, and the person of spiritual consciousness picks it up, they'll get nothing from it. On the other hand, if the person at the mental level of consciousness finds it, that will be their meat. It won't be yours. And the other way around, the book that you read and enjoy will have no appeal to the person who's trying to make things happen with their mind. And that's the way it is. In order to recognize the thing, you have to first be that thing. In order to recognize Christ and Jesus, you yourself must have a measure of spiritual consciousness. Otherwise, you too will say, oh, isn't that our friend the carpenter's son? Isn't that Mary's son? But if you have that developed consciousness, you look right at it and say, oh, no, I recognize the Christ right there where everyone else sees the carpenter. To have a measure of the Christ means that you have the ability to relax in the realization, thank you, Father, I already am. I don't have to go any place, I'm already there. I don't have to achieve anything. All the presence and all the power of the Godhead is already manifesting itself. The infinite invisible is pouring itself out all the time. And all you have to do is look outside and see the flowers growing and the trees growing and uh, the stars coming out every night in the heavens the cloud formations in the sky, and you'll be able to know it's literally true. God is on the field. And that makes it easy to go another step and say, well, why am I not trusting myself and my affairs to the same power that makes those stars come out at night, the sun, the moon, controls the tide, brings about these miracles of nature, winter, spring, summer, fall, and yet here I am taking thought for my affairs and trusting it to keep the world going around while I'm asleep. Not a bit afraid that it'll crack up while I'm asleep, knowing that there is a power operating to maintain it, yet I'm not trusting myself and my affairs to that same power. You see, truth is so simple that Jesus said only children can receive it. Only those who are not trying to have this reasoning apparatus satisfied, because it'll never be satisfied with spiritual truth. Spiritual truth is really simple. Really simple. You boil it down to two words. I am. I already am. Here and now, I already am. Going no place, going to accomplish nothing, achieve nothing. That is why meditation becomes such an important part of our work. Whatever it is that you will hear this week, you would be foolish to believe with your human mind. Very foolish. Because all the evidence out in the world is to the contrary. There's only one way you'll ever be able to accept it. And that is if the still, small voice imparts it to you from within. If within your own being you feel the assurance, see or hear it, and then begin through that inner assurance to watch the harmony as it appears in your experience through nothing of your own. I can tell you right now the theme of this week's work. Only one thing needful, the feel of the present. That's the theme that is being developed this week. In other words, we will 
be called upon within ourselves to make this statement. It isn't a demonstration of person, place, or thing that I'm seeking. Because even if I got it, you know, there'd, there'd be another demonstration needed next week. There's only one thing needed. If we could have the feeling of God standing right here with us, beside us, or within us, we wouldn't want anything else with us. We actually had an awareness. If you could see God as plainly as you can see me standing here, you would never ask for anything else, would you? No. If you could have a promise that every time you walk down the street, there'll be two of you instead of one. Remember the three Hebrews that went through the fiery furnace, and lo and behold, there was a fourth one there. You'd be willing to go into the fiery furnace, too, if you had the assurance of that other one, wouldn't you? You don't believe that the flames could burn if God were right by your side, do you? No. No. You wouldn't be afraid of any atomic bombs flying either if you had the assurance that God was standing right there holding your hand. Because it'd have to destroy God in order to destroy you. That doesn't seem likely. Now, what problem is there in your life that you would have any concern over if you could feel God holding your hand right now. Or if you could hear the voice of God within you saying, Peace, be still. You wouldn't care for the stormy waves outside. You wouldn't care for volcanoes. You wouldn't care for sin. You wouldn't care for disease, lack, limitation, unemployment. What difference would it make if you heard a voice saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whithersoever thou goest, I will be with you. That would end all of our problems, all of our worries, all of our fears, like we heard the other night in the 23rd Psalm. Suppose we did go through the valley of the shadow of death and had a feeling that God was going through it with us. Would it make any difference to us? Would you be afraid to go any place with God? No not even the valley of the shadow of death or the fiery furnace. In thinking of that story of the three Hebrews and the furnace, I think of a story, this is a true story, it was told to me by a banker in New York City. He was a uh, Christian scientist, and uh, it was his habit every uh, Friday afternoon to take home a black bag with a factory payroll in it and uh, deliver it to the factory Saturday morning on his way to the office. And on his way home, he had to walk in one place through a vacant lot. And uh, on this particular Friday, he was carrying this black bag, and as he approached this black, this, uh, vacant lot, the thought came to him, I've forgotten something at the bank, I've forgotten something in the bank, I must go back. He couldn't figure out what it was that he had forgotten. But in obedience, he turned around and went back, let himself into the bank, sat down and tried to figure what it was he had forgotten was anything, not a thing. And pretty soon his peace returned to him and he thought, well, that's a strange thing, I wonder where that came from. He locked up and went home. The next morning, he read in the paper that just at that hour, at that time when he was to go through that lot, a man had been held up, robbed, and killed. And he thought it had something to do with his own sensation the night before, so he watched, and uh, eventually two men were caught, and he got permission to go to the tombs prison to talk to them. And sure enough, they said, why, certainly you were the fellow we were after. We knew you had that payroll. But when you got to that lot, you turned around and went out. And when you come back, you had that other big fellow with you, and we weren't going to tackle two of you. You see, that was the answer. That fourth man that was in the fiery furnace, that was the second man that was with him. 
But we wouldn't fear to go through rocks. We wouldn't fear robberies, holdups, or anything else if we were assured that we had that big fellow with us. And that, evidently, is the theme of our work for this week. And that is what we are here to develop, the consciousness of that presence. We have nothing to do now with demonstration. We have nothing to do with the removal of dangers. We have nothing to do with the attainment of security, of peace, of anything. We have to do this week only with one thing. The realization, the conscious realization of that presence, because when we have that presence, we can go through the fiery furnace, we can go through the waters, and we will not drown, we can go anywhere, any time in life, and feel our full protection, support, and supply. We will remember this week every incident that we can recall from Scripture. Now, here's the value of Scripture in our work. Supposing we start back with Moses and realize that after his illumination, remember, after his, see, his trials and tribulations didn't begin until his illumination. Most of us think they're going to end then. His began. But they weren't personal. That was the difference. Once he had the illumination, these trials and tribulations were not personal to him. They were personal to those who did not have the illumination, and his illumination made him their guide and their guardian and their protector. But he had to go through them. Now then, after the illumination, he takes the Hebrew people out, and when the armies are pressing on them from the rear, we find this cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. What is the pillar, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, except the consciousness of the presence of God appearing as that form, just as our banker, with his consciousness of the presence of God, the sense of peace that he attained, it appeared outwardly as a big fellow protecting them. There wasn't any big fellow there, and I'm sure if we had been with Moses, we probably would not have seen that uh, cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. It wasn't visible to the human eye. It was the spiritual realization. And it appeared outwardly so that we could see it too, but not necessarily so. At any rate, Moses, one man had the consciousness of the presence of God. He had the realization that I already am, not seeking something, not needing something, that I already am. And because I already am, the infinity of God is where I already am. And so in the need for protection, part of that I am appeared in form, as form. And that form was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Later, when uh, they came to the Red River and the danger was in front of them, this same I am, this same consciousness of the present, separated the sea, divided the sea, so that they could walk through. It doesn't make a difference whether it's a literal experience or figurative. One thing is certain, that they walked through danger to safety. And they did it through the illumination of one man who was able to say, I am. In spite of the fact that there's an army in back of them and a Red Sea in front of them, he still can say, I am. I am in the secret place of the Most High. I am where mortal belief can't find me. I am... Uh, living, moving, and having my being in God consciousness. Now, the Hebrews, remember, were in fear. They didn't have that sense of God's presence that he had, and it was fortunate for them that one was God as a majority. Just one, one Christ realization will carry millions of people through to temporary safety and security. Then it rests upon their shoulder to demonstrate that realization of the presence. 
lead her in the presence of lack and limitation, that same realization, I already am, I am that I am, nothing can be added to me, nothing can be taken from me, I'm the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that realization appears as manna falling from the sky. Now remember, there was no manna separate and apart from Moses' realization. Will you remember that? There was no manna, and there was no opening of the Red Sea, and there was no cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, except as the activity of the consciousness of Moses. That's the most important point of this entire week. There is no safety, there is no security, there is no healing, there is no protection, separate and apart from one's consciousness of the presence of God. All good comes into your experience as a result of the activity of consciousness, as a result of the activity of the consciousness of truth you entertain. It's up to you. There's no God out here. There's no power out here. There's nobody out here who cares whether you live or die. It's an activity of truth that takes place in your consciousness. That's why you hear me rant and rave about these nonsensical hymns you sing. Are they hymns? Yeah, I guess that's what they call. Because they're always pointing to something out here who's loving you and protecting you and doing something from you, and all the time those pawns ache like the mischief and the back hurts and all the rest of the things happen. And you sing hymns to this great thing that a lot of nonsense. The purpose of those hymns originally was to hide truth from the world so that the average person wouldn't know the truth. Always remember this, if you ever learn what the truth of being is, you won't need churches or ministers or rabbis or priests or practitioners or teachers. If you ever realize what the truth is, you will know that I and the Father are one right where you're standing. You'll be like the Bostonian. You'll know you're already there and you don't need any mediation. No outside God, no outside Christ, nothing. The only purpose even of a Jesus Christ is to make you aware of that which you're now in ignorance. The only purpose of a teacher or of a book is to enlighten you as to your true identity. Once you wake to the truth, you'll see yourself as you really are and you'll be satisfied with that likeness and then you'll be through with all this nonsense of singing him to our beloved leader and our beloved teacher and our beloved this, that, and the other thing. Because it's nonsense. In the end, all shall be taught of God. Where is God? Within you. An activity of your own consciousness. And you have to become conscious of it within you. So that if you were a Moses leading people out of sin, sickness, lack, limitation, the realization, thank you, Father, I already am, would be their protection. And if you were the head of the household, your realization of omnipresence would be the safety and security of your family. And if you were a practitioner or a teacher, your realization of this truth would lift your patients and your students into the realization of their true identity and make them dependent then only on the realization of the presence and power of God within their own being. Now we go through scripture and we find Elijah, his own people out to kill him. Why? They had turned back to Baal. They had turned back to false worship. And uh, in that state of mind, there is always a hatred for truth, always a hatred for good, for spiritual good. And so they weren't satisfied merely to turn their back on God and worship Baal. 
but they even had to kill all those who represented the worship of God. That's what was been true, too. That's why Jesus was crucified. That's why the Christians were fed to the lion, and that's why metaphysicians are persecuted to this day, for the simple reason that the rest of the world isn't merely satisfied to go its own way, but it has such a hard fear of truth that it wants to kill all of truth's messengers. Now, Elijah is out in the wilderness, and his people are out to chase him, kill him, destroy him, and of all outward appearances, he's forsaken by everything and by everybody. Yet in that horrible plight, he wakes up in the morning and finds his breakfast all cooked for him, waiting for him, right in front of him. Cakes baked on the stone. Another time he finds ravens bringing him food. Another time a poor widow bringing him food. What is all this? Well, what's taking place actually? His consciousness, remember this, his consciousness of the presence of God appeared outwardly as that which he needed at the moment. I happen to have been fooled. Later, his consciousness of the presence of the God appeared as a still small voice telling him that 7,000 had been saved out for him, a remnant of those who had not bowed their knees to fail. In other words, God had even saved out a congregation for him, a new activity to begin life all over with. This God that did this for him was not something separate and apart from his own consciousness of truth. It was, in fact, his own consciousness of truth appearing outwardly as food, protection, care, and ultimately the, the new start in life. In reading that experience of Elijah, you will notice this that it speaks of the angel of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the Lord. It all means the same thing. It means his consciousness of the presence of that infinite power right where he was. The place where on thou standest is holy ground. The place where on thou standest is holy ground. Now, when we say that, we're also saying, I am. If the place whereon I stand is holy ground, it must be because I already am holy, harmonious, complete, perfect, infinite, immortal. That's what makes it holy ground. Again, if we say, Son, all that I have is thine. We're again only saying two words, I am, I am complete, I am fed, I am supplied, I am all in all. No matter which one of the scriptural terms we use, it all comes down to the end, well, after all, that just means I already am. Whatever it was that I have been seeking, whatever it is that, that I believe is separate and apart from me, actually... It already is here where I am. I already am it. I already embody it or include it. What is lacking? My conscious realization of that truth. The only reason is that we look out through mortal or materialize and judge finitely instead of allowing ourselves to be reassured by that spiritual inner voice where our meditation comes in. By abiding constantly in meditation, we continue in attunement with, in at one with, that infinite source within our being, and it imparts itself to us. It appears to us one moment as the voice of the Lord, giving us whatever assurance we need. And it appears another time as the angel of the Lord, giving us protection, and it appears another time as the Lord itself opening the Red Sea. It'll appear in whatever form is necessary. It can even appear 
in the form of a big man walking by our side, or a fourth man going through the fiery furnace with us. There's no limit to the ways in which the consciousness of the presence of God can appear. Now remember, it isn't a question of God appearing. It's a question of your individual consciousness of the presence of God appearing. There is uh, the vital secret. All religion will tell you of the presence of a God. All religion will tell you that God is omnipresent, or more, God is omnipresent. And then you say, well, yes, but what good is that for me? Doesn't seem to have done much for me in these years. And there is where the connecting link comes up. God is omnipresent. God is omnipresent, but that's of no avail to you. That's of no avail to me. That is only avail to us in proportion to our consciousness, our conscious awareness of that presence. And that's why our entire truth life, our spiritual life, must be devoted only to one purpose, and that is attaining the consciousness of the presence of God. Let all the problems go by the board. If they can eat us up while we're doing this, let them go ahead. Sooner the better. They won't, though. Our mission must be to lay down now every problem, lay it aside, because even if we got rid of it, it'll bob up tomorrow in another form. Let us attain that which, having once attained, we will never again be faced with a problem of a personal nature. Yes, we have problems for this reason, that having attained this consciousness of the presence of God, it gives us a mission. It never comes to us merely for the selfish purpose of uh, making our lives content. You see, when it came to Moses, he couldn't stay on the hillside with his sheep anymore. He had to go back and get into the turmoil of the world and bring the Hebrew people out for 40 years before he could find any peace. And so it is with Jesus. You would say that with Jesus' great sense of uh, God's presence, he could have had a wonderful life by going off and building himself a little bungalow somewhere and staying out on the hills with God. No. No, just think, he could multiply loaves and fishes and he could tame the waters. He could have had a good time if he could only have lived to himself. He never would have been crucified. Never. He'd have had a wonderful time, but this thing won't let them. And so he had to take this consciousness of the presence of God, which virtually ended his personal problems, and go out and meet the problems of his Hebrew people. He not only had to meet them for him, he had to make the supreme sacrifice to show them what the purpose of the mission and the message was and is. It's been that way all down through the ages. As you know, my, my background is Christian science originally, and I have often wondered why, after the first few years of Mrs. Eddy introduced Christian science and her sales of books mounted up, oh, I imagine that as far back as 1890, she must have uh, accumulated a quarter of a million dollars at least. And in those days, a woman living alone in the world with a quarter of a million dollars in rent for mansions running $40 a month, she could have lived like a Vanderbilt. Why she didn't retire to the country and live there instead of putting up with all of the conditions that she did put up with, hard conditions. She was betrayed by almost everybody that ever was around her. She was robbed and defrauded and cheated everything else by everyone that came in contact with her, and the world. The more good she gave the world, the more it hated her, and the more it vilified her. I don't know why she stuck it through. I do know why. Now, uh, the consciousness that she had that brought her her bodily health so that she could live to 90 in good health and work day and night, day and night, day and night until she was past 89 years of age. 
that consciousness wouldn't allow her to use it for selfish purposes or for her own self. And so she had to stay in harness, work for the field, work for the world, even while it was double-crossing and everything else. And uh, right up to her last minute, she couldn't lay down the burden. Well, I suppose it was the same with the Fillmores. Once they had the light, there was no way, I'm sure, that with all the money that accumulated to them, or to their work, that years and years and years and years ago, they could have left this field of strenuous activity and gone away and done what the present generation has done, which didn't have the light, of course. Just say, oh, well, why battle the world? Let's feed them a little tap and be satisfied. But those who had the light, those who received the illumination, couldn't have done that. They had to battle through and give the world that which they were ordained to give. Once you're ordained of God, that is, once you receive the spiritual life, it's never for your selfish use anymore. Then the only reason you have problems is not for yourself, because no matter how fast they come or how thick or hard they don't bother you, they are for those that are given to you in your charge. So when you receive the light of illumination, Remember this, that you are also ordained unto men. They go together. You never receive the light of illumination and uh, then a country home somewhere to enjoy the sunshine the rest of your days. No. When you receive the light of illumination, once you receive this consciousness of the presence of God, you are ordained unto men and you are given a mission. That mission may not immediately appear or it may. And it may appear as healing work, teaching work, lecture work, or part of the world work. But always remember that in proportion to your consciousness of the presence of God will be your opportunities for the realization and utilization of it. Don't think you'll be given it merely for the purpose of uh, living this life of peace. It's a wonderful thing to come to a place where you have no personal problems, where nothing that goes on in the world concerns you as if it were you. It's a marvelous place to come to, even though it does bring with it the responsibilities of caring for those who come to you. I told you the story the other evening of our little Japanese lady in the island who caught this consciousness. But, as she says now, whereas before she had peace through the day to take care of her family and to rest and to read, now she has nothing but telephone calls day and night, day and night, no rest, no peace. Through. The diseases and sins of the world are on her shoulder, figuratively speaking. That's true. The light has taken all of her problems. She has no problems, but all the problems of her race and of her neighbors and of her friends are being brought to her door. And that's her way of fulfilling it. But at least she has the great joy of knowing there aren't any problems in the world once you see this light. Now, we come to the subject of meditation because it is through this meditation that we will receive our constant assurance and reassurance of the present. And our meditation will take different forms as we progress in meditation. In other words, I'm going to outline an activity of meditation this morning. But I'm going to tell you at the same time that as time goes on, this mode or method will not be necessary. It will change until eventually you find yourself meditating even while driving your car or doing your cooking or out selling a bill of goods. In other words, you will never leave the atmosphere of meditation. But that is a development. That is built, and it's built to a practice. So let's begin. First of all, get comfortable and uh, whatever position the body is most comfortable in, that's the position to take. 
There are many positions, body positions, toward meditation, but if we understand that the object of them is not esoteric or occult, the object of them is merely to get the body out of our thought, then we'll be able to uh, disregard what anyone may teach about posture in meditation and find that position which is most comfortable to us. Now, at the present time, as I said last night, I can meditate standing on my head. But there was a time when I could only get the right result by sitting upright in a chair with my back straight against the chair and my feet firmly on the floor. It seems that that is a natural uh, body position, and uh, the body doesn't get into the thought. Otherwise, other positions, you lean and rest, and the first thing you know, you've stopped up the flow of blood in the arm if it's leaning on something, or if your chair is too high, you'll catch yourself under the leg and stop the flow there, and the leg will go to sleep, you know, the foot. So the, play, the, the idea is to find a position of comfort, and nobody can be comfortable in your body but you. So find the position in which you are most comfortable, in which your body is less likely to improve. That's number one. Number two, and this is the most important of all, regardless of what thoughts come and go, pay no attention to them and do not try to stop them. Do not be concerned no matter what they are, no matter what the name or nature of your thoughts, and sometimes they can be ugly, Sometimes they can be disagreeable, and sometimes they can be the kind of thoughts that ordinarily you wouldn't like to entertain and wouldn't be guilty of. The reason is this. They're not your thoughts. The thoughts that go through your mind when you're quiet are not your thoughts. They're world thoughts. This whole world is just uh, a feeling man of people who are living in fear. Others who are living in tremendous sense of lust, greed, jealousy. And the atmosphere is loaded with it. And uh, while we're thinking and doing our work, we're pretty well able to keep them out. But the moment we get quiet, all these thoughts try to pile in on us. Now, begin with what I tell you, since I've proven it. They're not your thoughts, it's not your thinking at all. It doesn't make sense what the name or nature of these thoughts are that will come to you. They're not yours. They belong out here to the human world, and they're merely coming into you as if you were an antenna. Now, the thing for you to do is let them go through, and don't try to stop them, because if you try to stop them, you won't. You'll increase them. You'll multiply them. You will multiply them. You remember the story of, I told you last year about the blackbird? You remember it? No? Well, just take a minute to tell you. This uh, Hindu, very wealthy man, very sensual, felt that age was coming on him and uh, he was going to die and he felt he'd better get close to God if he could. So he went to a holy man. Swami and said, Oh, Swami, I want to know about God. Well, the Swami could see right through the man and knew the man wasn't interested in God. He was afraid of dying and he was trying to buy a little corner of heaven. And he wasn't going to have his time taken up with anything like that. So he said to the man, Oh, he said, You have some wrong idea. You think you have to come to a holy man to find God? Oh, no, you don't need anyone. You can find God all for yourself. Can I? You go home. Just sit down in a nice corner of your room, anywhere where it's quiet, and don't think about blackbirds. Don't think about big swarms of blackbirds in the sky. Don't even think about a few hundred blackbirds or even a dozen blackbirds. Oh, don't even think about three or four blackbirds. Don't even think of one blackbird. Then when you're not thinking of blackbirds, there you are. You'll be right in the presence of God. Oh, that's easy. So the fellow went home. Well, you know what happened to him, don't you? 
minute he didn't think about blackbirds, there wasn't anything in his life but blackbirds. And so it is, that's a principle of healing, too. The moment you try to stop thinking about your problem, the moment you try to stop thinking about these fear thoughts and envy thoughts and jealousy thoughts and lustful thoughts, you want to have them pile up on you so fast they will overwhelm you. The best attitude to take is this. Since they are only thoughts, what harm can they do? Who can they hurt? They're only thoughts. And thoughts aren't power. Thoughts aren't power. One of the first things you learn in this work is that thoughts aren't power. You can think things now doomsday and nothing's going to happen about it. So reading, pondering statements of truth, trying to realize their inner meaning is a way of making more active the Christ in your consciousness. Meditating is another way, what we call treatment is another way, attending of lectures on the level of your understanding is another way, classes is another way, whatever it is that will tend to lift you higher in your unfoldment, whatever it is that will keep truth active in your consciousness, all of those are the avenues necessary to this unfoldment until that day of miracles comes when the transition takes place in your life. And if you abide in this work faithfully, a day of transition will come. And that day of transition is the one in which something moves into you and takes over. And you no longer live your own life. It lives it. It just uses your body as a vehicle. It just uses your home or your talents or your mind as a vehicle. It takes over. It is that place where Paul came when he said, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. It was that same place that Jesus came to where he said, I can do nothing. The Father within me, he doeth the work. There is that complete relaxing of the self Oh, I never was, never will be anything. But it, the Father within me, or that Christ, it liveth. It goes before me to make the perfect place of faith. It goes out to make the contacts for me. It attracts to me everything necessary for my good or for my unfoldment. It brings me to the books that I need, the teachers that I need. It brings me to the opportunities I need. It brings me to the right employment that I need. It brings me to the right home that I need. It brings to me the sale of something that I have. It doeth these things for me. That is a specific place, point in one's life of transition, where you actually know, thank you, Father, I'm through. I have died and the Christ has been born in me, and it takes over. And it's a complete new life from there on in that you're always aware of something, doing something, and being something. Again, it is a consciousness of the presence of God. It's a conscious awareness of the presence of Christ. It's an actual feel of that presence and a complete reliance on it go out even and get a parking space if we just happen to need that. Of course, you know that in this work, the purpose of this work isn't that we should have this Christ to get parking spaces or to get manna from the sky or to sell houses or buy houses for us, but the activity of the Christ in our consciousness does those things as the added things of our existence. The main purpose of it is to show us that there is a God that lives our life, but really God is our life and we are immortal. God is our mind, therefore we are infinitely intelligent, infinitely wise, so forth and so on. 
And in our meditation, we will sort of sit up there at the top of our head. We will let these thoughts come and go with no concern. And at the same time, we will take some short statement of truth, whatever it is that's evolved to you through this morning's work, and uh, we will attempt to keep that ear open as if we were listening. And while we are doing that, I will be so consciously one with God that the actual presence and power of God will be here with us and uh, probably in some measure right from the beginning you will become aware of it. Now, of course, you will be doing it in the same sense I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all men unto me. In other words, the degree to which I attain the consciousness of the presence of God, to that degree am I going to lift you up to your apprehension of it. And that is only that you may see the possibility of it because ultimately you will achieve it through your own meditation. How is our meditation? Well, I think that will give us a little breathing space and before the two.